Before designing a strength training program, it's important to have at least a basic understanding what major muscle groups are responsible for different movements. This video is going to cover the major muscle groups along with movements they're responsible for and specific exercises that target them. I'm Dr. Elise Brown, and I'm a scientist who studies how exercise can help prevent and slow the progression of diabetes. Today I'm providing a crash course in muscle movements and exercise selection for various muscle groups. And this is not meant to be a comprehensive evaluation of every muscle involved in every joint movement of the body. When we discuss joint movements, it's helpful to assume that the body is in anatomical position, including standing straight up with arms at the sides, palms, head, and feet facing forward with toes aligned to each other, and feet apart. I'm also going to cover which plane the movement is occurring in. The sagittal plane runs lengthwise from front to back, or anteriorly to posteriorly, dividing the body in left and right halves. The frontal plane runs lengthwise from side to side and divides the body in front and back halves. And the transverse plane runs horizontally and divides the body into upper and lower, or superior and inferior halves. Let's work from head to foot. Starting at the neck, or the cervical spine, some movements include flexion, extension, lateral flexion, rotation, and circumduction. Although neck strengthening exercises are not commonly included in strength training programs, they can be used to reduce neck pain. Flexion is typically a bending movement that involves a decrease in joint angle when a muscle group contracts. Lateral flexion is when a body part moves to the side, and rotation involves a body part moving around its long axis. The sternocleidomastoid moves the cervical spine by flexing it in the sagittal plane, laterally flexing it in the frontal plane, and rotating the cervical spine in the transverse plane. Extension is more of a straightening movement involving an increase in joint angle and cervical spine extension results from the trapezius upper fibers contracting in the sagittal plane. Circumduction refers to the movement of the distal end of a body part in a circular motion and combines flexion, extension, and other movements. Moving down to the shoulder, flexion of the shoulder in the sagittal plane occurs through contraction of the upper fibers of the pectoralis major, coracobrachialis, and the anterior deltoid. Frontal raises are a common exercise to isolate these muscle groups. Shoulder extension is executed in the sagittal plane by the latissimus dorsi, posterior deltoids, and rotator cuff muscles. The next movement terms to learn include abduction and adduction. Abduction is the movement of a body part away from the midline, and adduction is movement of a body part towards the midline. Shoulder abduction in the frontal plane results from contraction of the upper fibers of the pectoralis major and deltoids, and lateral raises are sometimes used to train these muscle groups. Transverse shoulder abduction in the transverse plane results from the contraction of lateral and posterior deltoids and the latissimus dorsi, and these muscles can be worked using reverse flies. Shoulder adduction in the frontal plane is controlled mainly by the latissimus dorsi and the lower fibers of the pectoralis major. And lat pulldowns can target these muscle groups and work the muscles that flex the elbow. Transverse shoulder adduction in the transverse plane is controlled by the pectoralis major and anterior deltoid, and a chest fly can work these muscle groups. The shoulder girdle is comprised of the clavicle, or the collarbone, and the scapula, or the shoulder blade, and movements unique to this area and jaw movements are elevation and depression. Elevation is when a body part moves upward or superiorly, and depression is when the body part moves downward or inferiorly. Occurring in the frontal plane, the middle and upper fibers of the trapezius elevate, and the lower fibers of the trapezius depress the shoulder girdle and shrugs or power cleans can help to strengthen this muscle group. The pectoralis minor and serratus anterior abduct or protract while the trapezius and rhomboids adduct or retract the shoulder girdle in the transverse plane. At the elbow joint occurring in the sagittal plane, the biceps brachii and brachialis flex the elbow and can be isolated using bicep curls, while the triceps brachii extend the elbow joint and can be strengthened using tricep extension exercises. 
Moving right along down to the forearm and the transverse plane, the biceps brachii supinates and the brachioradialis pronator teres and the pronator quadratus pronate the radio ulnar joint. A simple forearm supinator pronator dumbbell exercise can be used to target these areas. The hip is next. The pectineus from the hip adductor group and the rectus femoris from the quadricep group and the iliopsoas flex the hip in the sagittal plane. The hamstring group, gluteus maximus, and the adductor magnus from the hip adductor group extend the hip in the sagittal plane. And banded glute kickbacks can be used for this area. The hip adductor muscles, including the gluteus medius and minimus, and the tensor fasciae lati abduct the hip, and the hip adductor muscles, including adductor longus, brevis, and magnus, gracilis, and pectineus, adduct the hip in the frontal plane. Side leg lifts with a band can work all of these muscle groups. Onto the knee with both flexion and extension occurring in the sagittal plane. The hamstring group, including the semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and biceps femoris, as well as the gastrocnemius and the calf, flex the knee. In the quadricep group, including the rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, intermedius, and medialis, all work to extend the knee. Banded leg curls and leg extensions can be used to work these muscle groups. At the ankle, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, eversion, and inversion occur. Dorsiflexion occurs by pulling the toes towards the body. Plantar flexion occurs by pointing the toes away from the body, both occurring in the sagittal plane. Inversion involves pulling the sole of the foot towards the midline, and eversion pulls the sole of the foot away from the body. And both of these occur in the frontal plane. The tibialis anterior dorsiflexes the ankle, while the gastrocnemius and soleus plantar flex the ankle. Banded exercises can be used to work the dorsiflexors, and standing heel lifts or calf raises work the plantar flexors. The tibialis anterior inverts the ankle, and the fibularis group, including the fibularis longus, brevis, and tertius, work together to evert the ankle. Bands can be used to work inversion and eversion muscles. At the lumbar region of the spine, the rectus abdominis along with the internal and external obliques flex the lumbar region of the spine in the sagittal plane as what is done in the abdominal crunch. The lumbar region is laterally flexed in the frontal plane and rotated in the transverse plane by the internal and external obliques, which also work with the transverse abdominis to stabilize the abdomen. Side bends and abdominal twists can target these muscle groups. Although many of the exercises that I mentioned targeted specific single joint movements, programming primarily multi-joint exercises such as the squat, deadlift, push-up, and row can be more time efficient as they involve more muscle groups. Thank you for watching.